I doubt that there's many that didn't respect you too <laughs> with your <laughs> reputation. Uh, was there ever any? Uh, I guess Jesse Barr, but that was before uh, you were. Yeah, uh, before before we came up there, we were still in the NWA. I just heard story and man, man, I mean, crazy, huh? I'll have to ask Haku about that one day, but did you ever hear what that was about with uh, Haku and Jesse Barr? Well, I just heard story. Uh, they arrived at the airport. You know, back then when they arrived, you know, some fan picked them up. Yeah. Well, I just speak for Haku and what's his name? Check. Jesse Barr. Yeah, yeah, Jimmy Bar. Jack Funk. Yeah, yeah, I think Jimmy Jack. Yeah. Well, he was Jimmy Jack yeah. Funk back then. So they arrived and those uh, two fans picked them up. And, uh, you know, Jesse, I think he was drinking a little bit or maybe in something. You know, he cast those uh, two fans, uh, you know, or two women or whatever, cast them and and Haku tried to calm him down and say, brother, please, you know, you know how he is. Please calm him down, you know, they picking us up, you know, and please. And so he turned out, this is what I heard, he turned around and cast Haku. You know, I say, Haku told the driver, stop the car. This is what I've heard. Stop the car, and he pulled Jesse Barr and beat him up and well, took his eye. There's took many different yeah, tales many, I mean, of that. This is what I've Wrestlers heard. all exaggerate, so I don't yeah, know. Yeah, don't this know. is what I've heard. Yeah. He beat the, the poor guy and yeah. I think run his head to the, uh, the top of the car and took his eye. And yeah. he and when he passed, bless his heart and who. And when he passed away with a, still one eye, eh? still one eye, no. What happened? To, they couldn't find the other eye? Or uh, maybe Haku eat it? Or, <laughs> they couldn't find one eye. See, yeah. you can find and clean it and put it back, but they couldn't yeah. find one eye. Is it true that the Tongans, I guess, used to actually be cannibals, or is that... Uh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Well, 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 not in our time. You yeah. know, back then, back then, you know, eh, you know, way back then, a cannibal time, eh? James Cook, Captain James Cook, he's the one, well, in history, if you Google, James Cook, he's an English guy, he's the one he found Tonga. Okay. He found Tonga, you know, Tonga is no white people there. You know, my skin, they, they, they call me a white boy because in Tonga, mostly black and dark, dark, you know. Yeah. Because half of my family, they are, you know, white. Right. So, well, back then, James Cook found Tonga. First time they saw a white, they, they thought the James, James Cook is a god. They treat him well and his crew, you know. So Cook called Tonga Friendly Island way back until now. Tonga is a nickname Friendly Island. Eh? People were so friendly, they treat him nice. James, long story short, same school and his crew, they went and found Hawaii. Eh? Yeah. And then they kill Cook and all the crew and eat. You know, and eat them. Not Tonga. And eat them. Well, okay. uh, Tonga was cannibal too, but they, you know, they, I guess they eat each other, but, you know. But I was only asking because you yeah. said Haku may have eaten the eye. So yeah, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> you had a very famous backstage fight with Iron Mike Sharp. What was that all about? Uh, you know, oddly enough, you know, I've heard you, you, you match that to a lot of wrestlers, you know, Honky yeah. Tonk Man, um, Hillbilly Jims, Hillbilly Jim. I just seen Hillbilly Jims and, and I watched you, Greg Valentine said something about it. Yeah. And uh, the whole thing is that that's the way they said it, that's not the way it happened because they weren't there. The only one that was there was Hillbilly Jim. I remember Hillbilly Jim being there and he didn't say it right either. And he's a great guy, good guy, real good guy really liked him um, not he was not a troublemaker at all and um, I was in the ring with Mike we had we were in Detroit Michigan at the uh, he I think uh, Hillbilly Jim said Cobo Hall or yeah he's we were, one of those two buildings Joe Lewis Arena Joe Lewis, okay. Joe Lewis Arena and uh, Mike and I were on it was a TV taping and we were on like fifth something like that it wasn't a, no main event whatsoever he was a, he was a jobber for me and um, we, he said, Vince came in and said, look, and you guys only got two or three minutes. Figure it out quick. You guys are going on next. I said, Mike, why don't you just do this? Why don't you just jump me, beat the shit out of me, and then go adjust your gimmick and then come go over that big one and I'll duck under and put you in the full Nelson. He goes, no, no, hey, I, I got more experience than you. I'll fucking call it out there. I said, Mike, we got two or three minutes. And so he didn't want to do that. 
we got out there and uh, we locked up and he started hammering me in the back of the head. You know what I mean? Hammering me, man. And uh, Mike was a real tough guy, you know, and and, and he goes, uh, no, just, just go down. I said, what do you mean go down? He said, go down. I said, I'm not going down. And he said, because Vince wants you to go down. So Vince set him on me. He just go down. He wanted. He's supposed to beat the shit out of me because I had gotten an argument with Vince a couple of days earlier, called him a cocksucker and all kinds of stuff, you know. And um, so anyway, he hit me, the, and I just put him in the full Nelson and just threw him down. And I think he rolled to the floor, but he got right back up, didn't sell it. And so Blackjack Lanza was there. And uh, when I went outside, I said, "Get your fucking ass back to the dressing room," you know, because I didn't want to do nothing in the ring. We got back in the dressing room and uh, I told everybody, I said, you make a squared circle because we're going to fight, me and Mike Sharp. And Mike Sharp says, I've been wanting to try you because he's a Canadian national champion or something. So he gets in his stance, in his boxing stance, and uh, he started throwing jabs under me and I'm kind of moving, moving. And then I said, Mike, and he, so he throws this round out right. He, he threw the first punch. I did not throw the first punch. So he throws his first punch and I cut one under it and, and caught him with a perfect left hook, dropped him, left him, left him alone. I told him to stay down. Uh, he got back up. I grabbed him by the hair and I hit him with a, like a like hockey, about six uppercuts in a row, dropped him. He started to get back up like an idiot. I football kicked him with my... At that time, I don't know who, who it was. I, I think it was Bob Orton. I'm not sure. I can't say for sure it was Bob Orton because he may deny it. Somebody jumped on me from the back and Harley Race took that person by the throat and grabbed him and shoved up against the wall. At that time, Mark, Mike had a pool of blood about like this coming out. I didn't mean to hurt him that bad. I love Mike. It's just uh, shit that happens, Hannibal, in, in the business. You know what I'm talking about. And um, it was Vince's fault. But Vince fired me over it. And so I went up to talk to Vince and... Um, I go up to talk to Vince and Mike's in the office. I didn't even know Mike was in there. At two o'clock, I was supposed to be there. I got there a little late and Mike was up there. And, uh, well, you're fired, you know that. I said, well, shit, you won't tell me who I am. I, I, I wanted to know if you're my brother or not anyway, so go fuck you anyway. And Mike Sharp goes, no, no, come back. And Mike uh, went to the hospital after that and uh, says, I started the fight. It was me to Vince. So Mike saved my position, you know, so I was really, really felt horrible because it was a, it was a pretty brutal beating, man. And, uh, and when he died, I know he died a little while ago and I felt bad about that. I don't mean to ever hurt none of the boys. I love the boys and um, it's just something that happened, you know. Was that the only locker room incident you were involved with? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no, I just love the boys. But see, in the borders of work, there's a lot of guys that don't want to do jobs, man. Yeah. And you, that's. Oh, just, trust me, I know. Off standing, like right here on one side of the stairs, and Savage is on, right by the stairs going down, and Hawk's standing leaning against the railing. So all I hear, and I'm standing right next to Hawk, I hear Hawk saying, So you call my old lady a liar? And. And then Savage goes, yeah, I'm calling the deuce bag a liar. And before he could finish his sentence, Hawk open hands Savage. Knocks Savage flat on his back. His glasses flew off his head. The cowboy hat went flying. Tassels got all messed up on his arm. And then Savage, you know, had to pop up and look aggressive in front of all the boys. Otherwise, he would look like a, piece, like a turd, you know. And Hawk goes, like, Hawk, you know, Hawk goes, yeah, I knew you had a chin like a girl. You know what I mean? So Savage was going to try to be a tough guy, and then Fujinami waist locked Savage and said no. Saito just said to Hawk, Hawk son, put his hand up. So Hawk stopped. Said, okay, my son. Big Jack Haynes brother come to Florida when when uh, Florida was still uh, the NWA down there, and uh, I I mean I. I was on I was on the lawsuit with him, and we we talked later in the years. And but brother, they they was not they was not a meaner, tougher guy ever come down the pike, brother Jack Haynes. He he ah, and strong, strong, so strong. So I mean. It, 
that's unbelievable. But one of the, one of the stories about Billy Jack was we're we're a spot show. I, it may have been Atlanta T. I mean, uh, 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 a sportatorium in uh, in Tampa. We 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 walk in and in the dressing room, we put our bags down. Me and Bass, JJ, JJ's already there. But me and Bass walk in, we put our bags down, and boy, something ain't right. Well, we we keep hearing. What we open the. There's another little dressing room. It's like it's like two dressing rooms right side by side, but there's they're kind of you know baby face over here, and, and Billy Jack is in there, pound, pounding, beating the piss out of Barry Barry Windham, Yellow Dog. At the time, he was Barry Windham and Yellow Dog. And I said to myself, man, Jay, I said, I said, I said, Bass, you, you know Mulligan's fixing to hit that door. He's going, he, he is going, Mulligan is going to rip, you know, come. Mulligan was tough. I mean, mean, tough. Going down a road, just jump on a, jump on a damn bull standing out in the field, try to tip him over. But, Billy Jack, pow, pow. Pounding Barry's butt, boy. Mulligan walks in there. <laughs> puts his back down. Say a damn word. Billy Jack, pow, kept, pow. Said something. It was over. It was over with. And um, Mulligan did the deck that, how you doing? Or <laughs> gets my ass go to, you know, anything. But he, uh, Billy, and and uh, I, I got to know him a little bit better than, than, I mean, he didn't hurt. He didn't hurt you in the. He didn't hurt you in the ring. I I was in his his uh, that full Nelson thing he done hundred times. And I, I'm I probably wrestling two or three hundred times. But he he uh, you don't want, you don't no you don't want to mess with you didn't want to mess with that boy. He he would hurt you. He mess you up. He mess you up. He mess you up. Uh, they 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 say you know that. My teeth, uh, my the fans, or some other stuff. They say, they say uh, that Bart needs a dentist, or Bart needs some insurance to get his teeth done. I'm, I'm I'm getting my teeth worked on, fixed, but it's just taking a while, brother, because it's that gum expensive. Even with in, even with insurance, it's so expensive. But uh, the deal is that Billy Billy, you know, Billy Jack Haynes has got a couple of uh, of these. Down my throat. I don't think he did it on purpose. I think it was, it was an accident. But uh, they, they say that I grinded my teeth off. Uh, I don't. I don't remember. I don't remember grinding. But anyway, I remember. I remember spitting them out. <laughs> I remember that. Well, he he's lost all of his teeth now, so you're doing better than him. I got. I, got, I still got three or four over here. Three or four over here, and. All, almost all the ones on top. I got it. What happened with you and Batista? <laughs> you know, in, in professional wrestling, I'm sure, you know, in, in combat sports, um, there's always going to be testosterone. You know, men a lot of times don't agree with each other. And um, and that's all it was. It was a disagreement. You know, him and I, we seldom like disagreement. But uh, if I saw, you know, him today, you know, he'd get a big hug and say, hey, man, what's going on? You know, because, you know, he's a man, just like I am. Arn Anderson, not too long ago, talk about a fight that you had with Matt Bourne that he said was one of the most brutal fights he ever saw. You ended up biting... Matt's lip off. I was wondering if I could get to your version of those events. Sure. We were in a bar. Um, I don't know. I, I can't remember the exact city. I, something tells me it was Wheeling, West Virginia. Um, and it's Flair's favorite. Ric Flair loves to tell the story. But um, Matt Bourne came up to me. Dick Murdoch was there. Killer Carl Cox. Um, you know, uh, Ric Flair, just uh, so many of the guys were there. 
Matt Bourne was new into the WWE, WWF, and, and he wanted to, I guess, make a name for himself. So he came up to me and he said, um, why are you messing with my girlfriend? And I said, excuse me, Matt, I don't, you know, I didn't really know Matt. I said, uh, who's your girlfriend? I didn't know I was messing with your girlfriend. Who's your girlfriend? He said, uh, oh, it doesn't matter. You know, or something he mumbled to me. And I said, okay, well, just, you know, have a good night. And, you know, I don't believe that there's no girls here that I'm messing around with. So if your girlfriend's here, I'm certainly not me. So as I turned, he sucker punches me and the back of the head. And he goes to uh, suplex me from behind. And as he did, when I was in the air, I spun around on top of him and wound up on the ground. And he's grabbing my ears and my hair at the same time. And he's trying to bite my nose. So I saw his lip since he was trying to, and his teeth. And so since he was trying to bite my nose, I went ahead and bit his lip off and spit it out. And then I beat him up all I had to beat him up. And I thought the fight was over. So, uh, you know, guys take them somewhere and everybody's having a drink. And all of a sudden, I'm no, out of nowhere, somebody jumps on my back. It's mad again. <laughs> jumps back in my back. Boom, boom, boom. We start fighting again. Finally, again, it's subdued. Uh, beat him up some more. His head looked like a, a swollen pumpkin. And um, I never started a fight ever. Um, but I've been in six pretty brutal fights and I never lost one. Not that I'm, I'm not, believe me, I'm very humble and I'm not bragging or anything because I, there's a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of people that can kick my butt on my best day. Um, and that goes for everybody. So you just never know. That's why it's always better to be humble and just get along with people. And I've always felt like that i don't i don't feel like i'm better than any fan that buys a ticket or the guy that picks up my trash i'm just we're all equal we're all human beings and we treat each other with respect and that's the kind of life that i've believed in for so so long and um and then so the third now the third time the bar's getting ready to close now this is about an hour well maybe not an hour about i don't know a half hour later maybe and uh Matt Bourne comes back and I'll, I'll never, Matt Bourne comes back, hits me again from, well, he went to hit me and somebody said something and I turned around and we started rolling again and boom, um, uh, all of a sudden I'm trying to drag him to the door and he trips me as I'm trying to drag him to the door. And, or I fell and I think he put his leg out and which is a good move. Matt was a wrestler before. And so I go down and as I come up, he's got his finger in my eye and uncle Ivan uh, Koloff was sitting there and he kicked Matt's hand and he said, no eyes. Uh, thank you, uncle Ivan. God bless you. And uh, so that that was the end of the the story. But that fight went on for probably fifteen minutes in total. Why are the bouncers letting them back in? What's that? Why, Why would they... the bouncers let him back in if he kept causing that? That's crazy. I have no idea, Devin. I have no idea. Now I don't know if this is true or not, but someone told me you were allegedly also in a scrap with Buzz Sawyer. Is yes. that true? Yes, that was. One of the six. That was one of the six. What was that incident in Drumheller where uh, someone supposedly blindside attacked him and he ended up getting the hell out of him? What it was about, uh, there was this, uh, I think you've been through Drumheller too, yeah. but uh, <laughs> we used to have this running rib in the territory about this, uh, you know, magnificent statue, statue of Stu. And, um, mm -hmm. Whenever rookies were in the territory in the van be, for like an hour before we got there, we'd be talking about the, the big statue of Stu, and uh, it's kind of like a landmark, and you, know, you go to see this statue and uh, whatever, and finally, you know, he'd come around this bend in this drum heller, which is 
famous for dinosaurs. It's kind of like, uh, you know, what uh, its main claim to fame is. And uh, you come around this bend and all of a sudden there's this like 30 foot high Tyrannosaurus. And then all the boys would go together, you little bastard, <laughs> and do a stew impersonation. And uh, so we, we, uh, we did this rib on this idiot, uh, new guy who just come in, uh, kind of a muscle head wannabe named, I think his real name was Jeff Belsner. He called himself Brick Bronski. And so anyway, we did this and uh, everyone had a laugh. And, a couple of days later, uh, I'm in the dressing room in Calgary, and uh, I'm not sure what uh, this idiot, Belsner, uh, he came into the dressing room, and I heard he had been stirred up by, uh, I'm not sure if it was Dynamite and, and whoever, but for some reason, Dynamite and Pillman never liked each other too much either. But anyway, this, uh, idiot uh, Beltsner came in and uh, Pillman and I are just coming into the dressing room and he's got like a, star Pillman had like a styrofoam coffee cup like that and he's, and all of a sudden this Beltsner just came up and clocked Pillman and uh, knocked him backwards into there was, uh, you know, a row of lockers against the walls and he's sort of standing there admiring his uh, worker. I think he figured he had, mission accomplished or kick Pillman's ass and he could go and high five dynamite or whatever and Pillman uh, crashed into the lockers and got up and Beltsner standing there kind of smiling and Pillman who was pretty tough you know legitimate NFL CFL linebacker and all speared him into the wall flying tackle and kind of bent him in half and beat the living shit out of him, you know, to the point where I saw the bones coming out of his uh, eye saw, you know, his cheeks, and you see the white bones and the blood and the boom, 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 boom. And, and uh, I think Pillman, uh, when he had gone into the, uh, when he speared him, he hit his locker on the, hit his shoulder on the corner of the locker, separated his shoulder, Pillman, but he, uh, beat the living crap out of this guy and the guy uh that was the end of his wrestling yeah career. and that sort of was unfortunate but uh it, it kind of gave me some perspective about pillman being pretty legit because pillman was only uh maybe 200 this guy's maybe 280. i later on heard some similar story it wasn't as graphic or grotesque or gra uh, Violent is that with Pillman and Sid down oh, in Atlanta? With the squeegee. <laughs> yeah, something like you that. Want to tell that way. I'm not even sure how that went. Uh, I just heard later on about that. It ended up Sid got his butt kicked or something, and he pulled yeah. out a squeegee to defend himself, yeah. and everyone laughed or something. Yeah, it kind of made. It's kind of like had the same effect as uh, when Leon White got his ass kicked by Paul Orndorff or whatever, you know, kind of deflated there. And uh, Zotti, you know, is, you know, he, he's a badass. So, uh, Johnny Springer knows uh, uh, Scott Steiner real well, too. I said, if Scott ever starts tapping his finger, I said, watch out. <laughs> I said, that's not good. Because that's, that's what broke us up. He started. He started believing things that the the gym was saying. I said, Scotty, look at you. You look incredible. There's nobody can look better. Quit. What are you fucking? Come on, man. That led up to a straight up shoot interview we had. That you could tell was a shoot if you watch it good. And that was in the Cincinnati. And then we had the, the Bear View Slam Parade that put the sign right together. Yeah. Did you see the Scott Steiner thing with DDP backstage when DDP jumped him over Kimberly or something? We're waiting at the live interview spot 
with Gene Okerlund. And Scotty is trying to rip Dallas Page's eye out at Richmond Coliseum 40 feet away. So we get, we're starting here. 20, 20, 10, 9, 8. Before it got ready, he was right in place. And nobody knew. He just tried to rip out Dallas Page's eye. And we just played it all well. We are, me and Lex already had our, what are we going to say? So we, I, I, I just got you to go first. And then me and Lex would end it up because we already had the ending. So we had a plan for the ending. And so he, but he, but he made it in with his, his headgear and everything. And back then he was still, you know, no chest problems or anything. He looked, he looked, he looked so great. I mean, he's one of the best buys I've ever seen. It really is. But not everyone is friends in this business. We are business, I, I like to say it this way, we are business associates. And things do get, things get out of hand just because there, there's tempers that flare, there is, uh, there's things that happen on, on, a, on a social basis where uh, fellas might have a problem with another fella. I mean, I've seen backstage problems over, uh, over a girl over a, a, a Sunday dinner that didn't happen or over somebody who came to Sunday dinner who didn't bring their own uh, bottle or whatever, you know, one of those Hogan things like, hey brother, I mean brother, I can't take this anymore. There's all this negative vibes around me. But tempers flare, uh, guys go out in the heat of the moment, somebody gets hit too hard or somebody gets kicked too hard and the next thing you know uh, there's a problem and problems are happening all the time. I saw Bret Hart and I'll tell a Bret Hart story real fast. I saw Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels down on the floor in Hartford, Connecticut. They cannot deny this happened because it did happen. They were in the locker room down on the floor pulling at each other's hair and they had to be separated and it had nothing to do with professional wrestling. It had to do with a personal vendetta they had against each other. These were two guys who just could not coexist anymore in the same locker room. And, and it, it, it finally culminated to, of course, the Montreal screw job, which, I mean, come on, give me a break. I can't lose the belt in Canada. Okay, well, we'll go across the border from uh, Windsor, from uh, Toronto, we'll do it in uh, Detroit. Well, I can't lose, it's too close to Canada. Oh, come on, give me a break. But things like that do happen. What happened with you and Jack Evans? Ah, we have a fight. We have a fight back then in Mexico. But uh, but we always cool, we cool, super cool now. I book him into my shows. <laughs> you know, I give him work now, you know? Like, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not one of those guys like, oh, I'm gonna have this bad feeling in me, you know, forever. Fuck that. Fuck that, fuck that, that's terrible. I mean, I, and I feel bad even to say fuck that. It's yeah. terrible to say even fuck that, you know? That's awful. Did you have many backstage fights in your career? Uh, I have one with him, and I have another one with, uh, mm, rest in peace. Uh, uh, Abismo Negro. It was oh, a it was an old timer luchador in Mexico. I have a big fight with him in the locker room. Yeah. What was that all about? Just, our, you know, he 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 disrespect me, in in a, in a way that I I would I would I was not able to, to 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 step back. You know, it's, there's limit, right? So I didn't step back and and I find the motherfucker. Everybody was surprised. They were like fuck. Who was fighting this motherfucker? He was bigger, bigger than me, stronger than me. Fuck this guy! Don't nobody respect when you when when you know I'm not a fighter guy. Or to be honest, I'm not. I'm a very like peaceful guy, and I've been learning that. You know, right now I'm a more than I'm a polity guy. You know, I, I'm I'm a, I like to to you know to put the ideas in the table and to. To be able to confront and to make facts and, and to, to work with him. I know you were close with Eddie Guerrero, but uh, there's a story out there that he got into it with you backstage one night. Is that true? Yes, it was it was a misunderstanding. Eddie was um, 
he was having problems at the time uh, with his health. Uh, obviously, this is uh, not long before he passed away when he had a heart attack. And we knew something was bothering him. We just didn't know. We had to come up with, uh, we, we were out in the ring and we, were, we had to get create heat with him. And uh, we had to get heat on him in the ring. So that means beat him up. My, my gang, my gang of guys, which was Luther Reigns, Mark Gintrak, and myself. I didn't touch Eddie, but they did. And I guess they laid into him pretty hard. And he came backstage. He was mad. And he approached me and said, why did you lay into me like that? You're beating the crap out of me. He actually used a lot more swear words, but I don't want to say it on the podcast. Uh, but um, I said, Eddie, I didn't touch you. He said, yes, you did. And he, he pushed me. And I said, don't push me again. He pushed me. I pushed him back. And he tried to double leg me. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't that hard to fight him off. I mean, being an amateur wrestler. Uh, it was pretty easy, and I put him in a chokehold, started choking him out, and then Big Show broke it up, thank God, because uh, I loved Eddie. I didn't want to fight Eddie. Um, you know, it, it was just – the crazy thing is, you know, 10 minutes later, JBL, John Bradshaw Layfield, goes to Eddie and says, why would you double leg an Olympic gold medalist? And Eddie said, because I'm a dumbass. <laughs> so it turned out to be pretty funny, but um, – it, it was it was pretty intense. I mean, uh, Eddie was pretty upset. We got to the arena, uh, municipal auditorium there in Kansas City, and I, I laid on the table. Was like I'm gonna take a nap before my match. I want to do good, and it's TV taping, so you also want to do real good. But I'm laying there hungover, like oh gosh, this hurts. <laughs> this hurts. And if, if actually I fell asleep, the next thing I know, um, I'm, I'm on my hands and knees in the dressing room. And I'm hearing commotion, all this noise. And then I see Scott Hall going, like, wow, chat, fuck it. You're leaving, going out the door of our dressing room. And baby faces. We had across the stage was where the heels. Back then, you know, they kept us separated, or at least tried, you know. The, this was cut open. It was like hanging a little bit. My lips were split. I mean, half of it was here, half was over here. And I'm looking like, what the fuck? What the hell just happened? What? And what was the whole thing with, with Nobbs about? Uh, we've we've heard that he's been known to use the N word from time to time. Was it over that or something else? We was at a show one night in Florida, and Nobbs was there, and he came out and he said. He was talking to, to 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 the locker room, and they were like, "Okay, let's listen to this motherfucker. What the fuck ever?" And I was like, "I'm sitting there listening to him," and somebody had texted me, and I was reading my text on my phone, and Nobs had just made a comment to somebody. And he looked at me, and I laughed. And he was like, Lucia, what you laughing at? You can't wrestle. And I was like, really? And he was like, you can't wrestle? So I stood up. I took my ring off, took my watch off. I set my phone down. And I hit him in the face. And he fell. And I jumped on him and I started beating the shit out of him. And he was like, Jack, what's wrong with you? We brothers. I said, well, I said, we ain't brothers. I said, I don't fucking know you. And during the whole time, he was trying to talk his way out of his ass when he was getting. And I beat the shit out of him. I beat the Fucking shit out of Nob that night. So he sent me this picture on Twitter where he was bent over showing his ass crack. And bro, he got a butthole like this big. 
<laughs> and if you go on my Twitter, it's on, it's still on there. Right? And I posted it on Twitter. And he he got my phone number and he called me. He was like, New Jack, why you gotta put that picture up? He said, brother, I'm sorry. And I was like, no, fuck you. I said, you sent me that bullshit. I'm going to post it. And he asked you to take it down, but I wouldn't take it down. I left it up. And it's still up to this day. It's on my, it's on my fucking Twitter. New Jack said he knocked me out three times because... I think Hogan would have to abandon you as a friend if uh, that... <laughs> oh, uh, he said it. Steve Strong was known for being a crowbar. And aside from the fact that he had a magnificent body, he's got a mind the size of a peanut, and he just, beyond that, not very talent. And uh, I don't know whether he was told by the uh, people uh, that they were set up the match to, to give me a beating, but he tried, and it didn't quite work. And uh, he was not a happy pup afterwards back in the, in the back room. I, I remember I drove my fist into his belly right up to his backbone. He pulled the same stunts at TV, and he'd, he'd beat up on these young jobbers at, at TV. And, I mean, beat them up. I was like, it's unnecessary. This kid's going to put, put you over and make you look good. What do you, what do you leave a knuckle imprint in the side of his head for, you moron? He was a piece of crap. I really don't want to elaborate on it, but the bottom line is, I'm sitting in the locker room, I see Brett, I see Vince and his Claire and his crew, Brett mad as fuck, because they already fucked him out the belt. I'm thinking to myself, damn, some shit gonna go down. And you know, Jim now will sit over in the corner, he get to doing this shit, brother, his goddamn beard, he's either up to no goddamn good, or some shit is about to break out. All I know is, is Vince, Look that fucking bread talking shit. Get the fuck out of my locker room. Get out of my building. You're done. Get out. Da 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 da. And all I remember Brett was saying is, shut the fuck up. Leave me the fuck alone. When I get done, I get dressed. I'll leave this motherfucker when I get good and ready. Vance says, you need to leave my building now. I remember Brett telling it over to him, look, I'm getting ready to take a shower. If you're standing there, when I get out the shower, I'm going to knock your ass out. Me, being the big smoker I be, I was already high by this time, but I'm just done. I'm sitting back and I'm bugging to myself, thinking, damn, shit's about to go down. Vince and his crew's over there, got his son, Pat Patterson, you know what I mean? He got a, um, the, the damn shooter from back in the day and shit. Uh, I can't even think of the Briscoes. We had a goddamn Briscoe. Briscoe, you know what I mean? I don't know if he a shooter or if he a hooker. Either way, that motherfucker hook you, you're hook. All I got to know is Brett said that shit. He took his butt ass over there, went and watched the goddamn shower. He came out of that damn locker room with a towel wrapped around his ass. He looked over there and see Vince still standing over there. Shit, he walked right back across the locker room over there, grabbed his jeans out that motherfucking locker. Didn't even get the water off his back good. Shit, goddamn shit. Didn't even put his drawers on, jumped down, airborne ranger, threw his jeans on, 501. But that motherfucker's about three butts, two undone from the top. Didn't even put his shirt on, stepped into his tennis shoes, turned around, looked at Vince, walked over there, bam, bam, hit him with a left, hit him with a right, bam, dropped him like a sack of potatoes. I mean, he went down, he went over, got to put the boots to him, his son jumped on top of him, got covering his ass up and shit, you know what I'm saying? Next thing you know, shit, that was that. The rest of the shit, I'm sure y'all can read in Brett's book. It was there the night that uh, Dick Slater uh, beat Sting up. Uh, I don't know if someone's beat him. I didn't see the actual fight. Uh, I was in the bathroom. Sting was in putting his makeup on. And I washed up and was walking out. Right as I opened the door, Dick Slater was walking in. And Dick was one of those, is one of those just, you know, casual, just go about his way guys. You know, I never had any trouble with Dick, although he's a tough old guy. Uh, I stepped aside and he walked in and I walked out. And as the door was shutting, I hear, you know, hitting. And then I hear the toilet flush. And... And Dick comes walking out, and it's like, it's like he went to the bathroom and came out. You know, I didn't know exactly what happened, but you know, quickly the the story circulated around the dressing room. Uh, Bill would let things like that go on, and if somebody was getting a little bit too big for their britches, uh, Bill would book him with 
you know, Slater or somebody and say, you know, hold your own, you know. Uh, but even in its own way, and again, not that I'm advocating it, but even in its own way, you can see, especially in the world of the wrestling business where so many play other places, the politics and things play in. Okay, if you don't like your position and you think you can take his position, then go out and take it. Uh, it has a way of teaching you a little bit of humility. Uh, or, you know, maybe I create a hell of a star out of it if you do go out and beat the hell out of my superstar. Now, I heard you talking about this with Nick earlier, but a lot of fans are asking it on here if you could tell the story about Nails and Vince McMahon that you're documented as the one that I guess kind of saved Vince from the beating that Nails gave him. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, what was frustrating again now is all of a sudden they're going to start piss testing everybody. And certain guys could never, and you know this, certain guys could never get off pot, no matter how hard they try. They've been smoking it since they've been nine years old, right? And Nails was one of them guys. And I didn't really figure that out till after all this, that that's why he had, he had no choice. He knew he couldn't get off pot. But we're driving to Green Bay, to Brown County Arena, and uh, we got a, a rental Lincoln rental car, and I'm driving, and Nails is in the passenger seat, and Kevin says, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna beat the shit out of Vince," you know, and uh, I says, "Really? Tonight? Yep." And uh, I said, what do you want me to do? And he goes, well, sit outside on the bench. And uh, when you hear the shit hitting the fan, I'm going to scream. He put his hand on my dick. You know. And uh, so that's what happened. I heard that. I go running in. Slaughter is there. And I'm actually like uh, pretending I'm trying to pull Kevin off, you know, just a little bit. You know, I just got light. I just wasn't going to pull him off because I promised I wouldn't. I, he wanted me to act like I was pulling him off. And Sarge was there. And, you know, when you grab Kevin Kelly, it's like grabbing a piece of freaking iron, you know. <laughs> Kevin's a badass dude. And I don't know, uh, uh, then the sheriff comes in and his deputies, and I hear Vince going, I seen red, then I seen yellow in my neck, and he had me up in the air. And um, uh, then Slaughter came in and saved me, and John came in and helped, and... Uh, and Vince goes, I want Kevin Kelly out of the arena right now. And this sheriff bowed up on Vince. He goes, Vince McMahon, you don't tell us to leave, that you can tell anybody to leave the arena. You know, and Vince had to just shut up and take it from these sheriff's department you know and there's nothing he could do not jj Dillon, not pat patterson not, nobody could save vince because the sheriff's side were not on vince's side they weren't on anybody's side they were just telling him he couldn't play policeman and tell us where what to do and uh so vince's uh Lawyers called me a couple of days later, and I basically just told them that what I just told you. And uh, Kevin quit; and he hasn't been back, and uh, and it, it just died out. That got swept under the rug pretty quick. I mean, don't you agree? Yeah. Well, people are still talking about it, but yeah. You know, but for what? How, how dramatic it was. It got swept under the rug pretty quick. At least yeah. back then. 
If it if, if that had happened with the internet today, it would have been massive. Oh yeah. Oh, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Oh, big time. And something happened backstage in WCW uh, at a time when you were probably at your one of your peaks in popularity in America uh, with Paul Orndorff. That we've oh heard, my God! We've heard a lot of uh, his side of the story. Yeah, you know, stop right there. You know what? Paul has made a living talking about this night, and he one of the one of the things he says. And, and you know what? I, I understand Paul's sick. I, I guess he's got throat cancer. Is that right? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's hard to say this, but, you know, I was there that night, and Paul, Paul had a crippled right hand. His, his right hand was the same size as my wrist all the way up, all the way up to his shoulder. And that's the hand he, he hit me with. So, I, real quick, I, I, I got to tell the story because I've heard, Paul, you know, what? it's like it's, he won't let it die. It's like 50, 20 years ago he was saying this, and then, Today he's still saying it. He's still doing interviews about it. And, and one of the things he said was, you know, I got five extra years of my contract. He kind of smiled. And, and it, it, uh, it, it, I need to speak out because I never have, really. So this is the honest of God's truth, so help me God. This, Eric Bischoff called me at 8 in the morning at the Marriott and said, Leon, you have promised me pictures for a photo shoot for weeks. You got to do them today or you're fired. And he says, I'm not kidding. So, hey, you get up and you go. Four hour photo shoot, and it's grueling, it's exhausting. And, uh, you know, where you had to go in your street clothes and then, um, you know, put your hot stuff on, get, get all pumped up, put your uniform on, and then start posing, right? And then, well, that photo doesn't look good, let's do it again, that photo doesn't look good, you know. So it just became grueling. And I had told Eric, please call over and tell someone that I'm going to be late because I'm doing this. And of course he didn't do it. So I just did a photo shoot. I had my bag and I went into the room and sat down. I, whew, I just did that traffic that, you know, from the Atlanta Towers over to the CNN Center. Yeah. And, and so what, you're going to sit down, right? <laughs> so I sat down. He came in and said, you're fucking late. Why are you late? And I, you know, I was trying to explain to him. I said, Paul, like, politely, Paul, I mean... Didn't someone tell you? I'm, I'm fucking doing this photo shoot. And uh, didn't Eric tell you? And uh, he said no and told me a fucking thing. I said, well, that doesn't give you a reason to fucking mistreat me. So then I said, you know, if that's not good enough for you, you can go fuck yourself because I've had it. I mean, this is, you know, I'm not getting cussed out by you. You're not my boss. And he thought he was. And you know what? I had been told specifically that during that period of time, Dusty Rhodes was my boss, period. And Eric Bischoff, those two. Other than that, no one is above you. Those two guys. Yeah. And I think Sting had the same range and Hogan had, well, maybe even a different range. Maybe, maybe Eric Bischoff couldn't tell him what to do. But, um, so, but that's neither here nor there. So he, he turned around and walked out. And Terry Tater comes in and gets me, Leon, regardless of where you were or what, you know, uh, we got to do some interviews. So... I got got my mask, took my shirt off, got my rubber hose so I could pump up, and I'm running to do the interviews. And Paul steps in and blocks me from going to the interviews. And uh, he called me everything in a book and threatened me to my face, face to face. So I slapped him. I thought that was a threat, a threat to my well-being and my safety. You know, hey, you're going to tell me you're going to beat the hell out of me? Well, you know, I'm going to defend myself. So I slapped him. His feet came off the ground, and he, he hit the... The, the, his back hit the the cement, and his head just met, missed this the steel steel toolbox where we they would put the tools to put the ring together. Right. And I thought, my God, if his head hit that, I uh, you know I'm done. I mean, no matter why I'm late. I mean, if his head hits that and he's hurt, I'm fired and probably go to jail. And so I, I went over and put my hand on his chest. Paul, are you okay? And he looked like he was coming too. Because he hit the ground hard. I slapped the shit out of him. So Paul's got a right arm about the size of this wrist all the way up. And uh, he's 200, 200 pounds. I mean, he's really in bad shape, you know, physically. He's not the Paul Ondorf that you would, you know, that 260, 270 pound guy. He's like 200 pounds, 215. And... Uh, so when he gets up, he gets up, and I'm thinking, 
you know what, if, if I fight him back and, and, and do what I, I think I should do to defend myself, I'm going to get fired, at the very least, and maybe I'm going to hurt him, because he's just, so he, he, I thought I had slapped him initially, so I wanted to get that back, so I let him hit me in the face, and it was nothing, it was that, that, that weak right hand. And he hit me a second time, he hit me a third time. I drug him down with me. And Paul, some, some of the, the wrestlers helped Paul up, and he kicked me once or twice before I got up. I remember that, and I got up and grabbed him, and we went into the coach's room, fighting like a wrestling type fight. But that was it. He had boots on. And like, you know, I don't know why that matters, but I guess if you're barefoot and slippers on, it's harder to fight somebody, right? But it was, I'm late, so what's he doing with slippers on? He's an agent. He's got his boots on. I mean, I, I, you know, and then the next day how Paul had beat me up. And, and what they're seeing is those three hits to the face. And I mean, it was like, it was like my, my 12 year old son hitting me in the face. But my role was to be the, the bad guy beat everyone up. Yeah. So everyone that I wrestled, uh, I was spudding, right? Yeah. So it's like, like Regal. I remember Steve Regal. I mean, I kicked the shit out of Steve because it was my job too, you know? And, he was very vocal about all that, you know. He said, yeah, you're not so tough now. And I said, Steve, fuck. You know, so I just shut up and walked away. Is it true that uh, Ming was involved in breaking that up? Yeah. In other words, when I took him to the coach's room, uh, Ming came up behind me and said, Leon, that's enough. You're going to hurt him. And you know, <laughs> at that point, I didn't want to mess with Ming because that would have been a mistake, I think. He's one of the people that... Uh, you know what? He, not only was he fresh, I just kept on fighting, but no, nah, you don't want to mess with me. Did you ever get the chance to see him in action in a bar? I never did, but I'd heard about him. That sometimes is the, the worst, worst, uh, you know, not seeing. You know, because you see, you say, well, you know, that, it ain't so good, or, or it is really good, but sometimes you can't see, you know. But that whole thing with Paul, and it, it's like, how many times have you heard that interview lately, he's still telling the same story. He's still getting over on this thing. It's like his thing, his you know, his claim to fame. So he's hanging on to that bullshit story. And that's exactly what it is. It's bullshit. And ultimately, you got released over that. And No, no, no. Nope. No, no. Ultimately, Eric Bischoff, and this was probably the second mistake I made. Because getting into, you know, slapping Orndorff felt good, but it was wrong. I mean, no way should I punch first, right? He got in my face. I said, "Go!" I should have told him to go and take his best shot. And once he did, then I could have, you know, done anything I want with impunity. But so that was the first mistake. The second mistake was when Eric, you know, he did send me home, and he, you know, I had heard that I was going over Hogan on the, on the first Nitro, which was coming up, and I was in suspension. So they were going to bring me out of suspension, you know, like this big thing. To have a surprise. Yeah, surprise, and... Because uh, at that point, they hadn't made the deal with Luger, Luger they were looking yeah. for something big. And I was going around Hogan, yeah, they were looking for something big. And, you know, I had heard that, much to my surprise, Eric was in my corner saying, hey, Leon, you know, it's a hard worker, and he's, you know, he took that WCW belt for a year, and never once, you know, had a bad match. And, and you were on the opening, actually, for the first Nitro, even though you never wrestled on Nitro, so yeah. you not really at some... So I heard that, and then... So Eric says, well, during this, this period of time off, you're, we want you to take a, a, a six-month pay cut, and that's a lot of money. I said, Eric, for, for this? I mean, I said, I can't see six-month pay cut. I mean, that's, that's a half your salary. You know, that's, what, close to $400,000 fine. That's shit, man. I mean... About 150, 200, I mean, something's, you know, and he wouldn't come off that. And so I told Eric that uh, if that was, was his decision, that I, I was going to go elsewhere. And that. And I just wanted to bring up you did mention your salary close to 400,000. I don't know if, if you want to talk about it, we can cut this out. That, that was half of it. Yeah, I'm only, yeah, that was half of it. I'm only going to bring this up because there was a recent podcast with Bruce Pritchard, and it was brought up on that podcast that. You were making about around that 750 range, and Bruce Pritchard shot it down and said, "No, there's no way Vader would have been making that much." How the f excuse me, how the bleep would 
Bruce Pitcher, WW Fish will know what I was making in WCW. Because the only two people that really know what I made was was Eric and I guess the, the excuse me, the WCW officials are the suits and my agent and me. So and without saying the Everything numbers, else was just, you know, Ric Flair. Well, come on, Eric, tell me. So Eric shoots out a number to make Rick happy and Eric's not gonna you know, Eric was under contract. I mean he had he had signed my contract. And it said, you know, confidentiality. We had a confidentiality clause. I didn't want no one to know. So, I mean, Flair, I mean, I'm not trying to bad my Flair, but someone, you know, like, hey, heard something and said something, so. So, basically, due to that pay cut reason, that's when you started talking to WWE? Uh, well, the fine. Oh, the I, fine, I didn't want to take the fine. Yeah. You know, they said, you know, you, you take the six-month suspension and this fine, and uh, you can come back. And you know what? And I said, come back with my full contract. In other words, he said, yeah, I'll do that for you. And in other words, the six months weren't, wasn't, weren't, wasn't going to be deducted, which was very fair on Eric's part. And see, that didn't stick in my mind that I'd come back even after, after, just after six months. Uh, you know, things would have been, I could have been in great shape, lost some weight, got tan, you know, then came back and made a real run out of it. So what made you make the big jump finally? Uh, well, I got a settlement, you know, uh, so we settled out on my contract, which was substantial because it was like, I don't know, six, six years left, but, you know, if you multiply those six years of what it would have made, you know, so it was a bad mistake on my part, but, uh, what, I don't know, I think pride and, you know, pride and business don't work, so that was a big, big mistake. Would that have been the point where the first altercation with the dynamite kid happened? Was that the injury? Nope. That no, injury? that was later. Uh, the uh, do you want to talk about that altercation? With we, the... may, we may as well get into that now because uh, we haven't talked about your British Bulldogs feud yet. That was the very first match at SummerSlam '88, yep. and I guess that feud, the behind-the-scenes feud, perhaps kind of started according to Dynamite Kid's book. You guys were originally supposed to go over in that SummerSlam match, but they refused and it was turned into a draw. Yeah, that part, I don't know. Personally, his book, uh, I'll stay polite about it, but uh, I don't give it much credibility. He had a distorted version of uh, reality, I think. Um, I never heard any story about them supposing to go over or us or whoever. When I got to SummerSlam, we we're going 20 minutes Broadway. Fine with me. Um, he was pissed off about it, you know. He had heat with my brother Jacques. I, <clears throat> I don't think I had. Uh, I, he's not a person that I appreciated very much, but I don't think I had any heat with him. I just didn't associate with him, and uh, I didn't particularly particularly like his antics that he was doing to some of the guys, uh, like held back Jack, and the, you know, you can almost get him to have a nervous breakdown and to to, to leave and stuff like that. He was a bully, and I didn't appreciate that, but I just never was around him. Uh, we had a hell of a match at SummerSlam. Uh, personally, I thought it was a very, very good match. After everything was fine, uh, I think, like I said, he had a lot of heat with my brother. My brother, you know, he has his own personality. Uh, you know, you, you can't like and can't be liked by everybody. So I guess he particularly had heat with my brother. Um, the, the story came up, there was a rib about that, you know, it was Kurt Henning that was playing both sides. He knew that Dynamite didn't like my brother. He knew that my brother didn't particularly appreciate Dynamite either. So he says, hmm, good opportunity here to create a rib. <clears throat> and uh, so he, he created the rib. I think uh, everybody knows the story about him saying that, uh, telling my brother to Dynamite I think he's the one actually that cut some of my brother's stuff, uh, cut his training belt, cut some stuff. And uh, then he told me, because my brother asked him also, uh, yeah, because we had asked to be on early because we could catch a flight home that night. 
So if we were on an early match, just flying out to Syracuse, we could make, and I know that pissed them off sometimes. At the end of the tours, you know, we were always trying to get home. If we could, if we could make a, a flight that evening home, it gives you a full day home instead of getting up the next day and coming home and wasting half the day getting home. Uh, we were in Syracuse, uh, so we, we had our match switch to be on the uh, early. We could make the flight home. The Bulldogs were upset about it. Uh, didn't say anything to me about it, but anyways, they were upset about it. And um, my brother asked the Bulldog, asked uh, Kurt Henning to um, check his bag. He said, I don't trust the Bulldog, this and that. But like I said, Kurt Henning, we didn't know was playing both sides. So he says, no problem. So when we came back from the ring, we didn't have time to anything. We just like, boom, hurried, head to the airport. We had somebody bring us right, straight to the airport, jump on the flight. When my brother came back to get his bag, See, I never had anybody check my bag. Nobody touched my stuff. But like I said, there was some heat there. So checked my bag. Kurt Henning just went like, gave him a head sign like, he, some, yeah, he messed with your bag. And we didn't have time. Boom, we're gone. That's when my brother saw his stuff were cut and this and that. So he was pissed. We had, that was the last, we had three days off. The next show, we headed to Miami. And um, Kurt Henning supposedly told the bulldog Jacques pissed off and he wants to call the office, say that you cut his things, which Dynamite did not, what I understand about it, because we never discussed this after. Uh, he did not, did I understood. Kurt, did Kurt Henning ever actually admit to cutting it? No, after this whole incident, I don't think he did, but I think um, it came out to where all the eyes were turned towards him and he was like now playing it, laying it low, but the, it had become so intense with the Rougeau Bulldog incident, everything else was secondary. That's not important anymore. Right here, there's a, an important incident or something potentious, potentially dangerous going on. Um, so we go home, we get to Miami, and uh, after the three days off, my brother's in the dressing room playing cards with Kurt Henning, like he normally did. And all of a sudden, the door opens on the other side. In the meantime, I had injured myself. Uh, actually, it was maybe a couple of weeks later because I wasn't injured in Syracuse, but I was injured by the time it happened in Miami. So maybe a couple of weeks went by. <clears throat> and I had injured myself with the Heart Foundation. Uh, pretty, pretty bad injury, which I could hardly walk. I didn't miss any shots, but I, I could hardly walk. I couldn't bend my leg. Uh, walking to the ring, the sweat would run down just from the pain of walking to the ring. So I'm stairs trying to strap my knee so it won't bend, you know, and this and that. And all of a sudden, dynamite kid comes in, my brother's playing cards, he comes from behind and slaps him in the back of the head. And it's like, bang, you hear what? And I'm like, what's going on? No, I don't have a clue why, why this is happening, what's happening. The only thing I knew is the bulldog supposedly cut his, cut his clothes, cut his weight belt, and the next thing you know, he's uh, attacking him from behind, hitting him behind the head. It's like, it's hard to process real quick. And then I look around and you've got, he had an entourage at that point around him. There was Dynamite, there was Bad News Brown, Ultimate Warrior, Davy Boy Smith, Don Morocco. All of a sudden you see all this, they all came from the other side. He probably was at the other side. They're all okay, I'm going to do this. They all came in and then this happens. I said, it's hard to process because it happens fast. It didn't last, didn't last a minute, minute and a half, the whole thing. So, uh, you know. So anyway, so he slapped my brother back in the head. My brother got up and he's like, whoa. And then Dynamite hit him one time. And my brother's like, what the F's going on here? You know, and I'm still trying to, you're trying to wonder, is this a rib? This is not a rib. It's, it's, it's happening too fast. It doesn't make sense. Then at one point, uh, my brother went to make a move towards uh, Dynamite, like to leg dive or waist dive him. He dove towards him. Dynamite fell on top of him. And then he got up and he went to kick him. My brother put his arms up, kicked the arm. And that's when I was there and I, I stepped in and uh, I told Dynam, I, I said, uh, I said, hey, that's enough, you know? And um, so, that I, oh yeah, so I said, that's enough. So that stopped. And then he went, blah, blah, blah. I was talking to Davey Boy or somebody else. So my brother was getting up. He's like kind of dazed from what just happened. I'm turning around like, I don't have a clue what's going on. Yeah, I turn and all of a sudden dynamite hit me in the neck. Personally hit like a girl. Um, so just to set the record straight here, he claimed in his book that he actually knocked you out from that hit. No, I think the only thing he knocked out was his common sense. 
uh, he did he knocked nothing out he didn't even phase me actually honestly a surprise probably the 10 year old girl could hit as hard as he did <clears throat> and it was at that point what is the circumstance i don't know because he hit me i wasn't even looking i was looking at you know, he just hit me in the neck boom and i turn and i say what you're gonna beat the shit out of my effed up leg right now too and he says oh we'll wait till it heals then we'll fight i said no problem that's what had it that's what that that's what had happened so after that he left they all left oh the next day we're on a flight heading up towards detroit on the flight he has the um, flight attendant announce uh, oh we'd like to congratulate the Ruto brothers on their new boxing careers you know so they got a kick out of that all right funny not too funny but he thinks it's funny um, I know my brother took it very very bad he, he, he got very deep inside himself and that you know it was, it's a depressing situation it's like what do we do from here and uh, the next day I was talking to him and I said there has to be a receipt here and he says I know and I said, if you don't do it, I'm going to have to do it. But I said, I'm going to have to wait. I couldn't stand up. I'm not, you know, you have, to, you have to use your common sense. I couldn't even beat up my sister with the leg I had at that point. So, and it was, it was very recent. It took, before I could say it didn't bother me anymore, it took six months. And we we're like a week, 10 days into it. I couldn't even, for the, first three, the next three weeks, I didn't even set a foot in the ring. I couldn't, couldn't stand. So we did the match, like I said, where I, was, I stayed on the outside. So I'm not going to go and challenge a dynamite, you know, that's, a, that's a, all full of steroids and whatnot, and I can't stand up. I'm not an idiot. I'm going to wait. Then when I'm ready, I'll bide my time, and then they'll get a receipt. Because I wasn't going to let that go by. So I told my brother, either you're going to do it or I'm going to do it. If you do it, It'll be sooner if it's me, it's going to have to wait, but he's going to get his receipt. My brother says, I have to do it. I said, fine, I'll back you on that. So the plan was stay, stay low all week, you know, because he's going to walk around being arrogant, cocky like he is, and uh, we ignore him. And if he tries to provoke any trouble, to ignore him. This way he's going to get set and he's going to think, ah, he's broke, he broke it. Uh, He's broken morally and this and that. Yeah, so he was always, he always had his entourage. Well, Brett was his brother-in-law. Uh, Jim Neidhart was his brother-in-law. Bad News Brown was Stan very P. close P. from the, guy. pardon? He was a Stampede wrestler. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So he was very close. And, and they had, you know, Dynamite's version, Dynamite's version. And they were family. They were click, which is fine. But, you know, you look, there's my brother and I. And then you've got, like I said, this whole bunch that are there. You say, okay, we'll have to wait. Uh, during the whole week, what we did, in the day, my, my father taught me to box when I was young. My, my father was a Golden Glove champion. He taught me to box. He had me box with all the kids in the area and this and that when I was young. He said, I want to teach you how to defend yourself, how to fight, not to become a bully. But if ever, you need, if ever need be, you'll be able to take care of yourself. Which it came in handy a few times in my career. Uh, <clears throat> so I taught my brother... That week, I'd set up the matches in the room against the wall, and I'd show him how to transfer his weight into the punches. Lay it in, lay it in, lay it in. And we did that for like three days straight. And then we had already anticipated, we said, Fort Wayne, Indiana, TV next Monday. I said, that'll be the day. Because at TV, you're there all day. At one point, there's going to be an opportunity where he's going to be alone. So for like the three, four days, practiced every day, hitting, hitting, hitting to get, to get more weight into his punches and stuff. So... At the end, decent. So, and the night before, he called my dad and I told him tomorrow the receipt's going to happen, you know, and this and that. And I told him, I could hardly walk, but I said, you know, I'll get your back. If somebody makes a move, I'll jump them. So, <clears throat> he, said, he says, all right. He calls my dad. That's what my dad told him to use a roll of quarters. He says, Take, tape up a roll of quarters, put it in your hand. He says, when you hit him, it's going to have a lot more effect, you know. So, so that's what he did. So the next day, we're at Fort Wayne, Indiana, and there was, we're at the ring, we're in the, and we even did on purpose, we went in the dressing room where the heels were, his click was, and all that, so we didn't look like we're trying to avoid anything. We just set our dressing room, our stuff up there. And uh, Dynamite came in, set his stuff up, not far either, you know, just to show. Dino Bravo was friends with Dynamite, and, uh, but he was also friends with us. He told Dynamite, he says, it's not over. He says, ah, F them. He says, they're broke. They're all weak. They didn't even talk. He says, Dynamite, I'm telling you, it's not over. 
He says, I know the rituals. It's not over. Bah, 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 bah. Hey, I'm invincible. Nobody can beat me. Nobody can touch me. And blah, blah. Anyways, he told him. <clears throat> My brother and I were sitting at the ring. On the apron of the ring. And we're just discussing, okay, maybe when, you know, wait till we have an interview, this and that. We'll go, we'll find him, this and that. Then Vince comes out to the ring because he heard what had happened. <clears throat> he says, hey guys, how you doing? I said, fine, Vince, how are you? He says, good. He says, uh, I've got a meeting with Hogan uh, now. And he says, right after that, he said, I'd like to have a talk with you guys. No problem, Vince. So that's what my brother said. He says, we've got to do it now because he's probably going to say, I heard what happened, you know, what happened this and that. And if there's any more problems, I'm going to have to fire you guys, whatever. He says, we have to do it now. But I said, okay, let's go. So we got up from the ring. <clears throat> we went back. And then everybody was over at the cafeteria. So we, we're on our way over to the cafeteria. And then we crossed Pat Patterson. He was just coming out of there. So we're like 30 feet from the door of the cafeteria. And Pat stops, hey, guys, how are you? Pat knew what was going on also. And Pat knew it wasn't going to end there, too. So he told Vince, this isn't over with what happened with the Bulldogs. Like I said, you have, to, you have to be respected. If you don't get respected in the ring, you're going to get walked all over, whether it's in the ring or in the dressing room. So I always looked at it a bit like being in prison. If you don't command respect, you're finished. So Pat told Vince, he says, Vince, this isn't going to be over. I'm telling you, there's going to be a comeback. Dino Bravo was telling Dynamite, this isn't over. He says, yes, it is, F them, and this and that. And, uh, he said, I'm telling you, it's not over. So we head over. I crossed Pat Patterson 30 feet before the door with the cafeteria. We're trying to find where is he right now. Now we're going to keep an eye on him. As soon as he doesn't have 50 people around him, he's going to get his receipt. So Pat's there. Hey, guys, how are you? So I said, fine, how are you? He's good. So what's new? Nothing. He says, ah, oh, so nothing's new. He knew it. He's just trying to see if we're going to talk. No, nothing's new. And uh, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm, it's funny because Pat Patterson's in front of me. I'm looking next to him. I'm not really hearing what he's saying because all of a sudden we see uh, Davy Boy Smith walks by. Don Morocco walks by. Uh, Ultimate Warrior walks by. We're starting to hear a lot less bodyguards around him right now. And so I'm, I'm looking at Pat, but I'm looking at who's coming by. So I'm looking, oh, okay, we're, the odds are getting better here. All of a sudden, Dynamite comes out, and he was alone. My brother just said to me in France, because Pat's talking to me, I don't hear 10% of what he's saying. I'm just too focused on what's going to happen right now, you know. So Pat's talking to me, and he says, hey, are you, I guess my response wasn't what it should be. Or, uh, he says, are you listening to me? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not even hearing what I, yeah, yeah, yeah. My brother, all I said, I heard him say was, <clears throat> he says, I'm going to do it. So I just keep looking. I didn't want to turn because if I turn, Dynamite sees, whoop, both of us, he might get a little, whoops. He's just been told 20 times by Dino Bravo, this isn't over. My brother had a book in his hand like he's reading. He's standing. So Pat's right here. I'm here. My brother's about six feet away. Dynamite's going to pass between us. But I'm looking at Pat so he doesn't feel like, whoops, I don't want to pass between these two guys. I'm ignoring him. I just heard, I'm going to do it. So Pat's talking to me. I don't hear anything now. I'm just expecting to hear something happen in a few seconds. I see him coming up to it. And all of a sudden, I hear, pow, right in the mouth. That's when Pat went, hey, hey. I grabbed Pat, and I pushed him in the wall. I said, butt out. I said, this doesn't concern you. And, I, and he's yelling, guys, guys, come and stop this. And I had Pat by the, by the, the clothes holding him there. I didn't want him to stop it. And it was funny because, like I said, my brother, he's never claimed to be a fighter. He's never, you know, and he hit him. He expected, he expected that fight to fall down. He lost four teeth when that punch came. And, uh, but he was staggered. His eyes were crossed. He was just staggered. When I turned, my brother was in front of him. And it was funny because like, I was playing a robot game. I was going, jab, jab. You know, and Dynamite's like trying to keep his feet. His feet were like slipping all over. He's knocked out standing up. Hit him, you know, just go into him. But uh, that's, uh, it's funny because I was calling the shot. Hit him, jab, jab, jab. And then, then Bad News Brown came out. A couple of guys, Pat jumped in. I said, stop this, stop this. They were holding dynamite up. The blood was all over the place. I said, good job. I said, uh, on Bad News came up to you. What is this, two on one? I said, hey, buddy, my hands are clean. 
and he did this by himself. So um, then they all went to dynamite. Like I said, he had four teeth that were gone. The blood was all over the place. So we turned. I said, now we need to go see Vince. So we went to see Vince, knocked at the door. Vince says, uh, what is the guy I said, we need to talk to? He says, well, I'm not done with Hogan. I turned to Vince. I said, uh, we need to talk to you now. And I point to my brother's hands. He sees the blood all over. He says, oh, shit. Like, I'm too late, you know. And he knew it was going to happen, too, but he didn't figure it so fast. When he came to talk to us, it provoked us to have it fast. He provoked the, the event quicker. So that's when Hulk says, hey, brother, I'm out of here. So we went in and uh, told him, look, and I told him, square out. I said, if you want to fire us because, fire us because of this, I'm fine with that. I said, with what happened the other night, I said, we didn't look for this. And I said, uh, what he did was uncalled for. But I said, we couldn't live with this. And I said, the rest of my life, I have to get up every day, look myself in the mirror to comb my hair. And I said, I wouldn't be able to do that if, if it would have just stayed like that. So I said, if you want to fire us now, I said, that's fine. I can live with that. He says, no, I don't want to fire you guys. I want to keep you. He says, but stay here. He says, I'm going to go get them. This has to stop now. He went and, we were, and he says, you don't open the door to anybody. Because, you know, situations like that can get out of hand real quick. You can get a mob thing going on, you know. <laughs> So, and uh, so we're in the small dressing room about 10 by 12 and the door's locked and he says, don't open to anybody. He says, I'll come back. He came back about 10 minutes later. He says, okay guys, I want you. He says, just for the update, the Bulldogs, they take him to the hospital. He said, he's pretty messed up. He said, his teeth are gone, his face is messed. He says, if you wanted a visual impact, you did a hell of a job. So, but he says, now, he says, I want you guys to leave for tonight. He says, come to Cleveland tomorrow. But for tonight, I'd rather you not be in the building. I, I want to stop this now because when they come back from the hospital, it's going to still going to be heated up. And okay, but I said the only problem of Vince is uh, my brother said, or I said, I don't remember what he said. We we did on purpose to have all our stuff in their dressing room with all his bodyguards and him. I said I'm not sure how safe it is for us to go in there right now. <clears throat> he says, okay, I agree. So he came in with us. We walked in. I remember there was uh, one of his. Uh, a couple of his guys, they just looked at us because Vince was with us at that point. And one of, uh, one of the guys looked at me like this. I just looked at him, kind of saluted him. <laughs> and uh, that was it, like, the heck with you, you know. And we just put our things in. He walked us out to the car and we left. The next day we were in Fort Wayne. Uh, we were in Cleveland. And uh, there was an agent waiting for us outside. When we came in, Vince wants you right now. He escorted us into Vince's office in Cleveland. And that's when he gave us the update that he had a meeting with the Bulldogs. When they came back, he says he was pretty messed up, this and that. And he gave us the whole story. And um, basically, that's where he says he told the Bulldogs if there was any any problems. He says, uh, the four of you will be fired. He says, I said that to calm the things. I will never fire you guys. But he said, I wanted that straight. He says, this has to stop. Because he says, I told him. He says, okay. He says, now what? And I said, oh, I'm going to break their legs. I'm going to do this, do that. Okay, fine. He says, obviously, you saw that things won't end there. He says, what? So you hit him, they retaliated. You'll have their legs broken. Do you think they're just going to go home and say, okay, well, we're crippled now, we'll go home, and it's going to end like that? He says, what? Six months later, you'll come out of a restaurant with your wife and somebody will hit you in the back of the head with a baseball bat. Then what? You'll have somebody killed in their family. He says, this ends now. You know, finally, it calmed everything down. And uh, remember, Vince, he had said, there's one condition. He says, they're going to pay for my teeth. This and then Vince said, okay. So when Vince said that, I said, no way. You can relax. He said, I'll pay for the teeth. He says, I said that to calm things down. I'll pay for it. Okay. This For him, that was like, okay, they're going to pay to have my teeth fixed. I'll pay for it. I said, fine, but I'm not paying for his teeth. So <clears throat> maybe I did indirectly, and I don't know about it, but... I don't care. For the principal, it was no. That ended there. Uh, two, a couple of weeks later, we find out. Uh, Vince says, hey, guys, I have some bad news. He says, uh, because the thing was, he says, it's going to end. Because, you know, some guys are going to say, hey, you got to get even. you got to get even. And guys were telling us there's a comeback being planned and this and that. So check your backs. You know, you can check your back. What else are you going to do? We're not going to leave. You know, we're going to stay there. Uh, but then, uh, like Vince says, they, they don't want to leave this place. They're making money. He says, they don't want to leave. A couple of weeks later, when Madison Square Garden, Vince has us come into the office, and he says, uh, well, uh, bad news. Yeah, what? 
the Bulldogs gave their notice. They're, lead, they're finishing up at, uh, at Survivor Series. Okay. So now it's like, okay, so that his, his plan of them not wanting to lose their job doesn't stand anymore. So now the rumors of the comeback make more sense. Like they don't care, they're leaving anyway. So before leaving, he's going to try to save face. We have to be careful. So all of a sudden we checked on the bookings to see where we were in the St. Tell. So Vince had his book out. We looked and said, Vince, the, 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 the uh, last week in the territory, we're in the same towns as them. We're rarely in the same towns. It just worked out that the last week we're in the same towns every night with them. I said, Vince, this isn't good because if there's going to be a comeback, it's going to be in the last week he's here. And I said, knowing him, he's lost face right now. He's just a big overblown, overblown ego. And uh, he's, want, he's going to want to save face. He's going to go to extreme measures for that. So <clears throat> I said, you know, knowing the person, I said, it's very possible that we could cross him in, in a hallway in, in a building and just thinking funny like he is. He's walking by and he might just go up like this. I said, if he, if he gets within striking distance of me and if I feel threatened, I'm on the nail. You know, so uh, I said, it's, it's, there's a potential of something bad happening here. He says, I agree. So what he did is he had a, the last, the last night before the week we were going to spend with him, they were going home on tour because they weren't doing TV anymore because they were leaving. So we, he set, didn't set up a meeting at San Francisco airport. We're taping at San Francisco. He had them coming in go through San Francisco before going to Calgary to meet. So Vince set up a meeting in the Admirals Club. Uh, the two Bulldogs, my brother and myself and Vince, that's the first time we'd seen each other since the comeback. So <clears throat> at this point, because like I said, everybody pumps everybody to see what can we create here. So we said, it's good that we see each other first to defuse anything or just, uh, you know, if he has, he has a problem, say it. You know, we'll talk to you without having 50 guys pushing you. <clears throat> so we met there. We came in, we sat down. So Vince started by speech by, you know, I don't remember what he said, but he started the first two, three minutes, like to set the table. And uh, he says, like he was saying, I spoke with the Rougeaus, I spoke with the Bulldogs, you know, he's telling them he spoke with us, us, he spoke with them. And he says, Dynamite gave me his word that this is over. And uh, so anyways, we talked and, um, Dynamite says, you know, I don't appreciate the being sucker punched and this and that. I said, uh, I said, your, your attack on my brother in uh, Miami, it was uninvited. It was out of nowhere, you know, and unjustified. I said, whatever you heard, I said, it was unjustified. <clears throat> At that point, everybody knew that their Kurt Henning had been in the middle of that. <clears throat> so I said, you don't need an invitation to go to war. So uh, bottom line, and then my brother started to want to talk it, and I told him in French, shut up. I just, there was enough heat. I said, I think I could defuse something better than he would at that point, because right away down the says, oh yeah, they, right away they were both, I just said, shut up. And I, I took the floor and I just, you know, brought this. I said, look, <clears throat> I said, this is a situation. You initiated something, there was a comeback. Uh, Vince said you have spoken. He said that you gave your word to Vince that this was over. I said your word is good enough for me. I didn't 100% believe him. That's what I said. I said I don't, I'm not going to be stupid and say yes and then turn my back to him. But I said your word is good enough for me. Uh, I said as far as I'm concerned, you've got my word. It's over. And uh, I, you know, and I spoke to Davy Boy. Same thing. I understand you're caught in this, like I'm caught in this. But I said. Personally, it's, it's over, and I said, if you give your word, it's over. So Vince, uh, at that point, said, I'd like you guys to shake on it and all that. I said, I have no problem with it. I shook hands with Dynamite, shook hands with Davy Boy, my brother shook hands, boom. And then we left. We said, okay, that's the way it's going to be. So we left. The, 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 the last week, like I said, I told my brother, we can't be idiots either, and just say, okay, oh, it's over, and close your eyes, and, you know, so when he'd take a shower, I'd stand guard outside. Yeah, I'd just be there. And we wouldn't both take showers at the same time. He wouldn't take a shower and I'm somewhere else and vice versa. You know, we kept... Oh, and Dynamite said something when we had that meeting too. And he says, because <clears throat> he didn't want to give any credit to my brother for that. You know, because Dino told him, he says, look, I know Raymond. And he says, it's not over. I'm telling you it's not over. So Dynamite says, 
one thing I want to get straight, brother, he said, I, I credit you for the comeback. I don't give him any credit. That's what my brother says. Hey, I, I said, shut up. You know, it doesn't matter who, whether it's, he did, he gave his own comeback. It doesn't matter who did what, what he did it on his own. He got the cuts and the, it took a lot of guts to do it. A lot of courage because he was, he was nervous. He was scared of doing it, but he says, I have to do it. So I give him credit for doing it. So anyways, uh, after that, it was over. We left. So the last week, like I said, we were being very cautious and uh, we stayed at different hotels from the guys, just not to leave anything. Um, you know, the guys, uh, where are you staying? Oh, I don't know. We're going to find a check in somewhere, you know, just to avoid that last week, anything happening. The week ended and then we had the last match. We're working with them at Survivor Series. It was just a coincidence. It was a five against five at the Survivor Series. Vince worked it out to where he wanted us out of the ring early and leave the building because it was their last night. So if something happens, it's tonight. So Vince says, I want to end this now. He wanted us eliminated early, just leave, get out of the building this way. After that, they're gone and it's over. So that's, that's pretty much in detail what happened with the Bulldog story. Now, did the incident with the uh, Hawk happen on that tour? As a matter of fact, it did. Um, and it all regarded about pretty much everybody being stressed out, um, been out of gimmicks, uh, been, on, been out of Roy's, been out of the stuff that they used to have and stuff like that. I think that had a, a lot of tension and stuff to do with it. And then me, you know, just Scorpio and the mouth that I have sometimes and shit, you know, I mean, had a lot to do with the situation too at the time and stuff, you know, I mean, Ric Flair standing in the door doing the Ric Flair thing and Hawk looking at Ric Flair and Ric Flair looking around like he might be looking for somebody and Hawk says, you know, I think Ric Flair's looking for somebody. Maybe he's looking for me to to go ride in the car with him again and me being as smart as I be, I said, F that pussy, let him ride by himself. And I guess he didn't hear the F part or the pussy part or whatever it was. And he asked me what I said, and I said it again, and next thing you know, shit, fight was on. Were you a little worried uh, getting in a skirmish like that in North Korea with your passport seized? I thought I was going to be thrown in goddamn jail and be locked over there, and everybody was going to be back over there in Japan, and my ass was still going to be in North Korea, stuck in a damn jail, and ain't done a damn thing I can do. Thank God it was on the bus, not in the streets. And it wasn't something that was more serious where, you know, one of us, you know, you know, was in the process of having to lose a limb or something like that and had to go to the hospital because then it probably would have been some kind of charges or something, you know, brought up, brought up on me or something like that would have happened, you know, so. It was more of just a quick thing and when it was over, it was over. No, not necessarily. It kind of lingered on for, for a few hours and a few days and stuff like that. And by the time we got back to uh, Japan, it, pretty much was all squashed and settled by that time and stuff. But uh, I was also forewarned by uh, Black Cat Nicholson, rest in peace, that also told me at the given point in time, hey, look, bro, because I was uh, planning on doing some uh, some real devious type stuff, you know, that, you know, no man probably should be thinking of doing it in his right mind. And uh, like he said, yo, you know, if you do that over here, bro, you know, you're, you're pretty much on your own. You know, you can, you know, go ahead and kiss the states goodbye and your life. Um, if this happens in Japan, well, you know, that's a different story. You know, I could probably get you out. I know enough people I could probably get you home. You know what I mean? It won't be the safest way, but I can get you home. You know, so, you know, so from there, by the time we got back, it was all over with, said and done. 